Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gamers of all ages, and Ted, I know you're watching. Welcome to Meet Your Makers, uh, the show where we introduce and bring on the game designers, artists, and writers who make the games that we love to play so very, very much. And today I am incredibly lucky, based on the time difference, to have on our show Miss Kim Godwin. Kim, welcome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We uh let's let's start from the beginning. We go into it like what 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 started your uh gaming journey? Like in terms of like becoming a gamer and that sort of thing. What are your early who were your early games? Oh jeez. Uh so I grew up in a household with uh my dad always played uh D&D. We had like the second edition books on the shelf. So some of the Todd McFarlane uh illustrations the really bad ones on the shelf and they started playing that. Uh, I remember being in base housing and my dad would have people come over and, and play it and reading the books. Uh, so, and we used to always play uh, Games Workshop's uh, Talisman, if you've ever heard of that game. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that was that came out in 1983. I was born in 1983. So my dad had it and got all the, all the cards and stuff and all the expansions. And so I was playing that since I was old enough to hold dice, I think, and then uh, reading all the different books. So I, a lot of the Palladium books too. So um, Ninjas and Super Spies, Beyond the Supernatural, Superheroes Unlimited. Um, like when we moved to Maryland, uh, we used to go to the comic book shop every every week. My brother, when I was about nine, and my brother started playing Magic, and I started watching people play because there was no one at the time playing vampire uh that she had uh yeah because that's right. I, just, I picked up the cards like this looks cool didn't know anything about vampire the masquerade uh, but vampire the masquerade she had it looked cool i wanted to, and there was no one playing so i just sat down and i watched uh this one group this army guy and his group of friends playing uh teenage mutant ninja turtles nice that fucked up the really fucked up one from yeah. like back in the day i got that back uh, here i love that one yeah oh yeah, yeah. There's some weird, weird design choices now, but at yeah. the time it was it was cool and edgy, and I just got such a kick out of that. So, I've been doing this for forever. It feels like, but I didn't actually start writing uh, professionally for freelance until about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great! That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, what did you get started on? What was what? What did you cut your teeth on in terms of designing games? Uh. For real, for realsies, um, the first game line I worked on uh, professionally was they came from Classified, actually, which just came out on Wednesday. Nice. It's a good good segue. Go get um, it, people. Go get it. And the, and the week before, uh, uh, they came from Cyclops' Cave, and that was mm -hmm. my third. That was actually my third project that came out. So uh, this the order in which things have come out has been kind of kind of crazy, and with. Uh, they came from classified. I, it was my first, you know, baby writer project. So I wrote this, I got to write the skills and attributes and all the st stunts. Uh, and I think the, the most challenging part of that was writing the short fiction for the, for the trademarks, which got cut. <laughs> uh -huh. Cause it's like tweet length, uh, you know, tweet length, uh, flash fiction mm -hmm. for each little thing to describe what the heck's going on with the, with the trademarks, but they, they decided to say word count and they didn't use them. So it's like, Oh, <laughs> that's the <laughs> hardest part for me. Yeah. You, you sweated and slaved over it and they're like, sorry, it did not no, through no yeah. fault of your own. They just, <laughs> Oh yeah. Get rid of it. And then, so for Cyclops's cave, I got to write the archetypes. And so that was like a whole other realm of, okay, what sort of like fantasy hot take can I go with? And um, how would how would I play with this? And then how would my my friends who are like uh, awful uh, game gremlins play these character types? What would they like? And so I went from there to figure out the tropes and stuff. So that was a lot of fun. That's excellent. Um, it, and and it, did you just did you uh, just send in samples and that sort of thing through the Onyx Path uh, freelancer? Thing? Uh, I, I I had actually been considering it. Uh, initially, but I had, um, I was, cause uh, I had started getting into like the disc for, okay. So in high school I had started playing uh vampire, the masquerade. So I was about 13, 14 when I started playing Ma vampire, the masquerade in the late 19 or 98, 90, 99. 
Um, and I was like, okay. And I started playing it and then I went to playing online. Mm -hmm. And then for a long period of time, like, um, I moved away from home. I, you know, I got married and moved around a bit and uh, stopped playing all the World of Darkness stuff for a long time. I actually started getting rid of all my books, except for my uh, VTM book. And um, and then we started doing stuff online at get or started playing games on again really intensely uh, when I joined the Navy because mm -hmm. uh, my friends on the ship uh, were like, "Hey, let's play some World of Darkness. Let's play some Black Crusade. Let's play some Rogue Trader." So we started playing those, and it's like, okay, cool. And then we moved, and everyone transferred. And then I moved to Hawaii, moved from Japan the first time to Hawaii, and then uh, Vampire. Th fifth edition came out mm. i'm like okay that's kind of cool so i started get looking online and then i got into the world of darkness uh fan fifth edition uh fan discord mm -hmm. and then from there i started following like the the actual plays with with matthew dawkins red moon role playing and we started playing um chicago by night uh and then i actually joined matthew's uh discord uh well his patreon and i started playing games with matthew uh, through his uh, his Patreon, um, and at the time I was thinking, hey, uh, why don't I I need to, I'm going to start promoing my stuff, so I need to start building up a social media presence. Mm -hmm. So I started doing uh, book reviews. So I started doing book reviews rather intensely, and then uh, from one of my book reviews, I was um, contacted by somebody. Uh, the, one of the authors that I had written a review for, and he said, hey, I really appreciate your thing would you be interested in doing an anthology? So I was like, okay, sure. So I started doing an anthology with him. And then I got invited to be in another charity anthology by um, by another one of the writers who who is now as an editor for another anthology. Mm. And I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, right, uh, sure. and then uh, I got a message from uh, Matthew saying, hey, I see you've been doing a lot of writing. Would you be interested in working on this game? And I was like, shit, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's go for it. And so, and, and then I started, just because of this, this weird, like, trickle-down effect, uh, I got uh, pulled into it, and I've just been freelancing ever since. So, so 20 books, 20 books later, <laughs> I'm now developed, 20 books and four years later, I'm now developing. Uh, so it's that like, oh excellent. my god, it's like, oh shit. That is, that, I mean, that's the best kind of way to do it, because by the time you get to the point where you're actually writing this stuff for hire, you know these people, you know the world, they know you, they know they can trust you, they know that you know the canon, they know you know that they know that you know the canon, I'm just... Or I just fake it really good. Uh, hey, that, that can be good enough, frankly. Sometimes like, that's good uh, enough. Yeah, because, like, my first entry into, like, Trinity Continuum, I think... Uh, was was Aether, uh, mm -hmm. and then I got invited to work on um, a couple or three aberrant books in a row. I was like, "Holy shit, it's an aberrant summer!" Yeah. Um, so it's like, "Shit, okay, cool." Oh, that's so, excellent. So, yeah, and then like doing Onyx Path Con and stuff like that, I got to do play a couple of other games that I hadn't played before. So I was like, "Oh, cool." <laughs> that's that's what I'm looking forward to this year's Onyx Path mm -hmm. Con. Uh, I, I'm going to be playing in a couple of them, and, and it, it, they're games I've never played, and I'm mm -hmm. pumped for that. That's going to be fun. Um, so what is a franchise that, uh, now that you're building out your portfolio, basically, you've been working on a lot of projects, are there any franchises out there that you're just kind of like, a dream gig that you're like salivating over the idea of getting to work on? Oh, shoot. Um, well, I'm, I'm working on most of the new Onyx path lines. Uh, I'm... <laughs> so, all right. Okay. <laughs> so technically, technically, all right. um, I kind I kind of <laughs> fell into it. Um, uh, like, like, cause I'm, I'm part of uh, both of the earthbane cycle books. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wrote the path, powers and the um thesis and synthesis for the world below mm -hmm. so that was like 255 individual things uh <laughs> incoming yeah. from uh from aberrant and stuff it's like okay edges and stuff like that so thinking about like that and then uh i wrote the character creation section of at the gates which was makes some more per and now it's like instead of edges now we're working on perks it's like oh my god i can't escape these powers right <laughs> power sets and equipment oh my god <laughs> uh 
and then uh uh like I'd really love to do some more um, outside of Onyx Path. I'd really love mm -hmm. to do some um, Call of Cthulhu stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in doing some cult. Um, I don't know if Fantasy F Flight is ever going to retouch or anybody's going to retouch Star Wars, but I've had a lot of fun playing uh, Star Wars, uh, the FFG version of it with yeah. uh, like a Genesis hack uh, as well. So um, been doing that like a homebrew stuff that way. And I also would love to work on some uh, more Warhammer, work on Warhammer 40k. But oh, uh, I'm pr I'm I'm pretty open actually. Uh, mm. uh, like I consider myself a horror writer, but I kind of write in every genre. Um, like I I've been doing online role playing, like uh, freeform role play, uh, play by post stuff, uh, and that's been mostly science fiction or science fantasy. Uh, it sounds like you and I have almost identical backgrounds with this stuff. <laughs> I was raised on, on army bases all over the country and, and mm -hmm. the, the PX and everything were always good for having those mysterious role-playing game books that uh, my southern mother, who was terrified of the devil, would never let me come near. That was the one difference. <laughs> yeah, that, that was super weird because like, I remember being like 13 and then like being at North, like some weird Marine Corps exchange in Norfolk mm -hmm. and finding like an Imperial Guard book for like two bucks. And it was just like, and it was an army book. It's like, where the fuck did, what, right. what, 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 I've never seen that ever again. It's just now that I'm actually, you know, well, I, I don't play it as much anymore because I'm, I'm moving armies around is like too heavy. Uh, I can only imagine uh, that's, that's, that's just such a pain. Uh, I, I do remember when I was living in Savannah and uh, we have uh, guys from Fort Stewart come over to the game store I worked at and we'd play 40K and an inordinate number of them played Imperial Guard. And I and I said to him, I said, aren't you sick of this? Like, don't you wouldn't you want don't you want to play when I would think you'd want to play anything but Imperial Guard. And one of them thought about it and went. I never thought of it like that. You might be. <laughs> I don't, it, it's, it's, the it, it, it's the tanks. It's the tanks. It's the same reason why, like, um, like with, especially since, uh, like when I started playing when I was like 13, mm. uh, there wasn't really that many rules for, or options for like a tank army. Yeah. Um, and so we started building those, me and my dad started building that out for our, our uh, for our Imperial Guard army, but that was the same reason why, I, for the fantasy side of Warhammer, I was playing the Empire because they had all the cool war sh machines and all the different units. And I was like, "This is so cool! I can play. I can field my uh, my my steam tank. I can field my great cannon, my my uh, my Hellfire gun, like my half lean hot pot, you know. Yeah. And I can also field archers and, and my knights and stuff too. So I got best of both both worlds. And my brother is like chaos wood elves." Uh, and then, of course, uh, on the 40k side, he was all, like, Chaos, Eldar, it's like... <laughs> and then my dad and I also played uh, Tyranids. I was a Tyranid player. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I love my bugs, I love my griblies, I love my monsters, but you would play, you know, the great rivalry between them and the Imperial Guard, and you'd play them, and I'd go... Mm, I do love those tanks. Those are just, that that would be the one thing that would oh, make slide over. Oh so, yeah, as they're like yeah. sharing through your your the ranks of all your guys. Oh my yeah. god! Those and then so it's just weird. like the movement phase. The movement phase, I get is the, is your greatest enemy. <laughs> just fly, fly straight ahead, my pretties. No, no guns, just melee all the way. Just just charge across the battlefield. It's like the term is like they're such cheap troops too, in comparison yep. to like the the space marine players they put out five models and that's it 500 yeah. points yeah it's like well i've got i'm gonna i have 10 dice i'm gonna have to roll these five times and you're like all right just do what you gotta do uh yeah so that's oh that's it's a wonderful world uh my my podcast partner is going to be it's like oh you brought you got to talk about 40k in this show too huh okay great it's uh it's an easy one to bring up what can i say uh, so, uh, what are you working on now? Anything in particular that you can talk about? I'll say anything. Uh... So, so uh, I just finished doing the uh, World Below Jumpstart mm -hmm. for uh, with Matthew. Uh, so I got to put together a, a whole new uh, dungeon scenario. So I, I had I had a lot of freedom to come up with uh, with new with monsters and and how to like 
get people into playing World Below. And it was it's kind of similar with how uh, we approached uh, Rat in a Burning Cage for Trinity Continuum Assassins, where it was um, this one I had less of an outline. Um, it was basically, hey, this is the sequence. You know, I want. It was more like these are the the elements and the highlights. I want you to hit and go for it. And so I took a little bit and thought about how I'd wanted to set up set up uh, the world below jump start because it's like trying to pull in the lore. Uh, it's a brand new game system, so of course we have to walk through it. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to do. I was pulling up. Uh, interactive 360 uh, cave tours of uh, some of the like largest caves in um, in the world with rainforest. With it was really cool because it had the ambient noise, and oh, I could walk through amazing. the paths and stuff like that. It's like, oh, this is all this is all vibes and looking at weird mushrooms and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, and I'm also uh, I I finished all of that, so now it's in Matthew's hands to to do what he will with. Um, <laughs> And uh, I got to create runes and stuff for that, too, because I was like, uh, I wanted to do a visual puzzle. And I like having um, th interactive things with the, that players can engage with that isn't just dice rolling. Uh, like when I ran um, Aberrant for Tabletop Scotland, I actually came up with a book cipher. Uh, and I, <laughs> so I wrote it down uh, and then I gave them two books uh, that they could they, they, they could try to make solve it with as well as like a couple of other little things like I had a key fob which was part of the key for uh, unlocking what the book cipher was and I was like okay I'm gonna get this is the thing here now um, you can dice this out and I can give you clues you can just completely dice it or you can try to solve it yourself and I gave one person the, the special out of screw you I don't want to do this I solve it done <laughs> and uh, they both groups decided they were gonna solve it it took them about an hour so that was just a, like a really cool thing. Um, and I'm also developing uh, Scion Mythic Shards with Harumi. And that's been a lot of fun. And I have a, like a really cool team of people with really cool ideas. Uh, I didn't pitch um, Mythic Shards, but uh, it's it's going to be, be a different approach to Scion. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a few, sh few shards, different little realms where the rules are different and so it's going to be fantastical and i'm really looking forward to when we can share more about it that's excellent um now you mentioned before uh, you know you like a lot of the writers i've talked to on this show have uh, a background in at least playing with uh, the uh, white wolf uh, uh world of darkness and that brings you to follow onyx path and, and that sort of thing uh what are some influences that you have on your writing uh that aren't role-playing related um i really like pulling from history uh, i like mm -hmm. pulling from myth mythology uh like many of the scion writers i like to pull from like real world myths and folklore and stuff like that uh how i got into horror uh, when I was about nine years old was actually during my unicorn and mermaid phase where I was just obsessed with unicorns and mermaids. And so uh, I would just go to the library and I would just pull out every book I could on mermaids and unicorns and all the different mythology. And from there I got into like, uh, jumped into like the fairy tales and then the folklore. And so I kind of absorbed all of that and I was like, Oh, that's really cool. And then I started reading like, um, like a lot of R.L. Stein, um, mm -hmm. getting Christopher Pike uh, stuff, and then somehow I kind of jumped into reading Clive Barker, uh, oh, <laughs> the is, Recondition, yeah. and so those were my favorite things. Is like I loved reading uh, the Goosebump books, and then the Fear Street books, and then that, and then I just do that, or uh, I'll pull from, of course, history, um, like things I see uh, happening too. So. Mm -hmm. So it's just really interesting because it's like I consider myself a horror writer, but I have a strong fantasy background. I do. I read a lot. I love comic books, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's just like and then watching lots of movies. I grew up in a video store. My parents had a video store until about I was about probably um, seven or eight. And then um, we just movies were just such a big part of it or we watched get together we would watch next generation together mm -hmm. uh we watched voyager deep space nine we watched babylon five um we were 
I watched Buffy in my with my dad and my brother brother. Uh, we watched Angel. So we watched all these shows together just growing up. So like media has just been a huge part of our life. We always go to movies. We just go to the video store every Friday and just grab a stack. Um, so it's just watching, reading, uh, just a lot of, a lot of stuff, uh, with, with classified, it was really funny because I was, f- shoot, four years ago, where was I? Uh, I was, uh, I was, I, I know where I was actually, I was starting my second master's program with the National Intelligence University, um, cause I'm an intelligence specialist with the Navy. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, they came from classified. It's like, is, is, is a spy game. It's like, right. Oh shoot. I am. It's like, what, what can I do? So I started looking at, um, the, at the spy museum stuff from the CIA. The, uh, I went up to the cold war museum up in Warrington, Virginia, oh, and, cool. uh, was looking at some of that stuff. Um, like I was joking cause, um, with some of those materials I was working with class, for, for my uh, coursework was like some of the stuff was just so heavily redacted that I had like this 12 page document and one of the pages was just completely blacked out right. with only like with only like this one sec- sentence that said this has been re- this has been like redacted <laughs> by the CIA it was God. just like thanks thanks yeah. I, I, I okay thank you <laughs> great insights thank you yeah yeah oh, so pulling from stuff like that like uh like one of the stunts in um, they came from classified is actually a reference to something that happened in my uh, homebrew like mage fifth edition game mm-hmm. uh, is is this thing where I was the player and this thing ha- had a really good like charisma manipulation role and I was like okay I got to write this into a stunt uh, another uh, stunt write up was t- short fiction was um, referencing something that happened in our cold war cthulhu game with, with matthew nice. uh so so uh, like little nod i keep referencing that that particular scene as like uh like a additional success stunt role yeah for uh because it was just such a good good scene uh yeah. i really enjoyed it but i, I like pulling in like we diff- weaving in different things for aether i pulled like uh i actually picked up additional word count besides writing up the societies um, and to write about the Magog. So it's like, I kind of went on this trees of like, what if all myths are real? And I had written a, uh, a paper for that in, um, in junior college, actually mm-hmm. talking about uh, like the new England uh, vampire case with JB and the, and the narwhal with the unicorn as two examples of a, uh, these weird situations where the mythology actually has a very strong basis in truth with the JB uh, new England vampire case. It was a, someone that had died of tuberculosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because of uh, funeral practices at the time, people just thought he was a vampire. And so they uh, dug him up and rearranged his bones and reburied him. And then of course, no one else died, but all of his family members had died. So no one else was going to like have his body in the parlor rotting, you know, and with this con- very contagious airborne disease absolutely yeah and spread it yeah so it's just like weird things that happen in real life it's like yeah that's a real thing that happened the erdstall mm-hmm. tunnel thing that i referenced um it's the or they're called uh gremlin or goblin tunnels okay. um yeah. it's basically uh all over europe there's these random cave systems that kind of go nowhere sometimes and they're just all over the place and people don't know what they're for they just kind of find them so there's like all this mythology behind them. There's different names for them, but it was I, just like a cool thing that happened. I think that's always so valuable for writers to remember that old rule with writers, uh, you know, write what you know, which often has a lot to do with the fact that truth is stranger than fiction and can inspire mm-hmm. some really ridiculous stuff. I remember once I was writing a piece that was going to be like half, it would have one foot in reality and one foot in this fantasy kind of fairy world sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the part of reality, I was just drawing from my own life and it came so easily and it was very, it was a fun write. And then I finally got to the part with the, um, the fantasy stuff and I was just kind of stonewalled. It it just (laughs) took so much longer because I was like, wait, was I going to pay? Oh, because I just I was just like, it'll have fairies. That'll be easy. I can I can just come up with stuff. And of course I can, but it's just not going to come as naturally. 
uh, yeah, and um, and then it's like for fantasy, it's like well, like basic setting stuff. It's like, are what what not European, not Europe, are you going to use for your castles right. and stuff like that? And I liked using um, like the Cambodian castles or the Thai cast or oh. uh, not the castles, the shrines and the temples because they have like because usually when you see pe- photos of them, they're like overgrown with vines and they're mm-hmm. in the middle of a forest or in the middle of a lake. And it's like that is so much cooler. Uh, as much as I love like my European castles or my castles, some let's just a random castle in the middle of a, on an island in the middle of a lake. Yeah. Um, that, there's just so many cool things. That Cambodian architecture, there really is nothing like mm. it. It's so unique, I, and that's just it. That's why people need to broaden their horizons and their perspectives. It really adds so much flavor to your writing, to your life. Mm. Uh, uh, but that's that's enough. Yeah. For whatever. For me. <laughs> yeah, whatever I don't know, I just I'm a researcher. So like I research and uh I I got teased a little bit in my uh in my first master's program because for my ethics uh workshop, we had to write this write a like a 250 word thing, but we had to cite sources and I think I had like 25 sources for that like short section. It was like and it's like, well, this is the most heavily cited like like thing we've gotten and it's just like, well, you wanted it it's yeah. like I, you want us to cite my sources, and this is like, here are twenty five sources that verify that I'm not crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't make all this up, people. <laughs> but like, uh, like the amount of research you have to do for certain things, and then how much of it actually matters or gets in, it's like, how, like, oh shoot, I had like thirty pages of stuff to, um or not more than 30, like, uh, like reading through academic journals for Scion, uh, for Titan rise, Titans rising. And just, just to pull out like one, like snippet of information. It's just like, Oh man, is this the thing I'm going to source here? Okay. I'm not sure why it's been doing that. Sorry about that. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, when it comes to uh, playing a game versus running a game, uh, two mm. very different experiences, what's a game that is your favorite game to play versus running, uh, your favorite game to run? Um, I really love what playing uh, They Came From because it lets me do all my hot takes. I can be snar- I can be snarky. Uh, I can be as meta as I want to be, and I won't ruin the immersion. Like, because um, playing something like Cult, where it is very personal, dark, like horrific things you're dealing with, and you're like having this intense imagery and mood, and it's just like you see a thing, and my first response is. This is re- this is absolutely ridiculous. I need to release this tension somehow. I need to laugh, and then I'll make a comment, and then it just kind of deflates that mood. And it's like you build up all that tension, and it's just like, okay, I need to break, <laughs> and, you yeah, know, sort of yeah. thing. And it breaks the immersion, and that makes it a little bit harder. And there's just so much pressure, I think, as a player, because it's like you want to be involved, you want to be immersed, and then someone makes the comment, and it might be you. <laughs> and it ruins the mood. I have broken with so many games. Um, <laughs> by like, wait, well, wait a minute. Why don't we think about it? Why don't we go about it this way? Uh, so, so like, they came from is just such a fun game to play. I've played all the different variations of it now um, because of the kickstart. Like, how much work I've done on they came from since, since I've come on with Onyx Path. Mm-hmm. Um, for running it... Um, I've run a lot of Werewolf the Apocalypse and a lot of Vampire the Masquerade over the years. Um, like, I had a lot of fun running um, Aberrant, because initially, um, for Tabletop Scotland, I wanted to run uh, Aether, but I wasn't sure if we were going to be done with the uh, the kickst- if the crowdfunding campaign was going to be complete by that time. And so I had cooked up this um, this weird teleportation time table thing, and I ended up just making it a... Uh, an aberrant game instead and that worked out really well it's just like oh we're just going to do this instead <laughs> that works out nice that flexibility yeah so it's just um i'm probably be play testing with the with the guys on the ship 
because mm-hmm. um, I'll have a captive audience uh, this, this summer. <laughs> this summer, and it's like, okay, here's your NDAs. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna play test some stuff for Scion. So that'll be fun because they're like, what's Scion? It's like, what's Onyx Path? It's like, oh, this will be great. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That's it. A... We're gonna start from nothing. Well, I mean, uh, personally, I can. I, uh, the they game from games. I think might be one of the best role playing games out there for introducing new people to role playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my bachelor party, we played. Uh, uh, they came from Camp Murder Lake. I ran a game for my mm-hmm. friends, and only like one of the people at the party, because that's the kind of bachelor party I would have, uh, and only one of them had ever really role played before. So. It was all new people, and everyone ended up having a great time. And I think part of it's because it starts out with the attitude being light. You know, it's something oh, people yeah. can can relax with and just have fun. And it's pretty mechanics mechanics light. And most of mm-hmm. the mechanical stuff are: can I make the the storyteller storyteller story guide laugh? Can I make yeah. my table? Can I make the because like you get extra dice for saying snarky one liners? Yeah, and then you you just like. Pfft, whatever and and being you don't have to be immersed in and they came from because all the cinematics are bad writing uh plot you know plot holes bad writing tropes um wardrobe fails prop fails background fails or special effects or just laziness and continuity so being meta it makes it easier it's like you, you know Oh man, I just I just love it. Whenever I talk to people about uh, they came from, they're like, "Oh, that sounds really cool." Even my yeah. friends that don't role play, they're like, "Oh man, that sounds really awesome. Let's play it." Yeah, mm. I love that. I, I think that sort of thing is great. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a. This is always a fun question I like to ask. What What is a uh, module or campaign or pre pre written campaign or module that was like one of one of your favorites? Maybe it's a go to, or maybe it's one you've only done once, but you just you have a lot of love in your heart for that particular one. Without being without like plugging my own stuff. Uh, <laughs> Don't, hey, you can plug your um, own stuff. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> like. Uh, like um, a module that I've I've played before that I've really enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Pathfinder's Rise of the Rune Lords, oh, okay. uh, and also their straight. And I was playing uh, and I was running Carrion Crown for a bit for Pathfinder. Um, I really like that. I like is like or um, you only die you, you only die twice um, mm-hmm. with with Pathfinder uh, Society. Um, those were a lot of fun. I really for. Um, so, uh, for Vampire the Masquerade, uh, fifth edition, I really enjoyed uh, Chicago by Night. Oh yeah. Uh, we completely broke apart that timeline because uh, that's the type of gremlins I play with. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, like uh, I, the cult with the atrocity exhibition, which was really creepy, and I, I had a lot of fun playing that with Queen's Court. Mm-hmm. Um, so those modules were a lot of fun, and then of course I had a lot of fun writing. Uh, rat in a burning cage and then at the gates and at the gates let me was my first time touching grave and i was really grateful for the opportunity to do that little tasty bit and i had too many ideas so it's going into that because tasty bits are so small Mm -hmm. and it's like i wanted to do like five different adventure things and i narrowed it down to just seeds uh ideas for how to approach the cemetery and stuff because initially it was just like you know, write this tasty bit about this graveyard for VTT. Here's the graveyard map. And it's like, okay, what can I do with this? And then I got to in- interject something creepy into uh, the comedy game. So I was happy about that. Oh, that's always got to be a good feeling. You take mm-hmm. people off guard extra hard that way. Oh, yeah. The faceless angel, angel statue is just like, do you, it's like, if you get the reference, you get the reference. Otherwise, it's just like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, they came from is a is a fun line to write for simply mm-hmm. because it's it's already referencing all the all the stuff that I already love to watch and read. So it's like, oh darn, I have to go watch uh, all these eighties action films again. Oh oh no, Dang. break my heart. This, this I don't sucks. have to read an academic journal. Oh shit. <laughs> oh man. I thought I was going to fall asleep at eight o'clock trying to read, and instead I get to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger again. Damn! I watched okay. so many Arnie films, and 
And then it's just like, oh, wait, all this stuff's actually late 90s. It's like, you think it's earlier. Like, uh, Universal Soldier, I had a distinctive memory watching it in the theater. I was like, oh, man, that was like late eight is like no that was early 90s like shit how old was i (laughs) it bleeds together doesn't it it's Mm -hmm. uh my my wife and i were just talking about that this morning where she was talking about uh the golden girls and she just kind of reflexively said uh the 80s and she went wait a minute was that the 80s or the 90s and i said i think it was both and and you know Mm -hmm. it started in 85 and ended in 92 so it's kind of like married with children straddled that line too very much so oh you want to talk about influence that was I was watching that way too young. Uh, or The uh, Simpsons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's like, I remember one. that. No. I love it. I think I was in first grade when that came out. Mm-hmm. That and was then... a big deal. That was, people don't, it's just kind of a ubiquitous thing now mm-hmm. where it's, it's The Simpsons is everywhere. Uh, but that was a really big deal when it came out. It was, it pissed oh, yeah. off a lot of parents. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember watching the first Treehouse of Horror. Oh, those are always my favorite. Those are still mm-hmm. just the best. They still hold up for the most part. For the most part. Oh yeah. Let me see. Okay. Um. Where now we we touched on this a little bit before mm-hmm. we actually started. Um. But what your background? Uh. Do you have a background in creative writing and that sort of thing, or? Um. I don't technically. Um. So my undergraduate is, I have a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice with a Forensic Science concentration. I have a uh, Master of Geography uh, in Geographic Information Systems with a Geospatial Intelligence Analytics focus. Um, My second Master's is a, uh, I'm still finishing my thesis on it, but I have a, uh, I'm finishing my uh, Master of Strategic Intelligence uh, with a terrorism concentration, which was really interesting when I was writing aberrant uh, best at what I do because it's like okay let's talk about war with aberrants involved it's like okay let's I mean... talk about terror let's talk in like uh, hated and feared it's like okay uh, let's write about some um, aber or Nova uh, hate groups mm-hmm. and cults it's like perfect perfect timing for th- Perfect. It's just perfect for that. You year. are prepared at that point. It's like okay, it's like talking about radicalization and de-radicalization. It's like okay, cool. I'm ready for the. I'm I'm definitely ready for this. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but uh, I've been playing online, uh, like play by posts mm-hmm. and play by chat since, uh, shoot, two thousand. So it's actually no, probably a little bit before that. It was before my senior, my junior year. I was like 1999, I think. It's like I started playing on the White Wolf forums and I started doing like these weird freeform anime, anything goes, mm-hmm. uh, like, like school ch- school RPs. God, <laughs> Hi- playing high school in high school is weird. But that is fun. Since, it, yeah. And so now it's like 24, 25 years later. And. And then uh, I was like an admin for uh, the the Battlefield Academy uh, anime RP I was doing, uh, so I got to do a lot of wiki work and then like building out the world that way, and then like working on Star Army, which is a space sci-fi dystopia uh, RP that's a website that's been going on for, for past twenty something years, wow. too, and then going on and doing other stuff. So being a part of all those like online play by post communities has been really interesting and then um been writing i've been doing uh my own web comics since 2004 but i've been like and how i got into web comic writing was very similar to how i started freelancing and that was um i was a fan of a comic and i followed a link and i got in part involved with that fan community and i made friends with the uh the creator of the comics and then they're like, hey, why don't we work together on this? I'm like, okay, cool. And and then I'm writing and I'm editing and then I'm running a, doing a series with them. Uh, and, and so I'm still working with uh, some of those people uh, 20 years later. Uh, it's kind of kind of crazy. <laughs> that's I mean, that's honestly to me the best kind of advice you can give to people who are trying to break into this industry, who are trying to be a part of it. I think that's just... You, these people are at your fingertips you know don't bug them but at the same time like reach out you know try to collaborate try to get to know them 
Well, with the, it's kind of like when we talk about building out your social media, and it's like you can't just be plugging your stuff, the self-promotion stuff. P people get, like, tired of it, but it's like that's yeah. what it's there for. They People want, like, like um, sincere engagement on yeah. certain things, and, but you have to be very careful um, because whatever you say can and will be used against you on uh, social media 20 years later, and in the court of, of uh, social media, you are guilty until mm -hmm. the world burns down. It's well, just yeah, like... Yeah, guilty forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like some, some of these people that are being exposed and being canceled are, is like for good reasons. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're a bad actor. You're getting flushed out, but you mm -hmm. have to be very careful. But, you know, when you're trying to you don't have to agree with people. You don't also don't have to engage with it. It's like, if I disagree with something, instead of like arguing vehemently and loudly, it's like, okay, I'm just going to not get involved with this conversation. I'll yeah. just like block is the easiest way of going through it. Yeah. And that's one of the things we always tell our freelancers is like, you don't have to be in the fan spaces if you do not want to deal with it because certain fan spaces are a lot more vocal and being mm -hmm. very uh about what they're unhappy with uh with world of darkness of course you're familiar with um uh, with how that discourse goes oh sure and like mechanics and stuff and it's just like oh man i couldn't bless their hearts it's just like whew. well some of these people it, it it is shocking where um this i because I, I don't get involved i i don't i don't have mm -hmm. any interest that uh, uh, my name's Paul, and this shit's between y'all. I, I just don't, mm. I don't get involved. But it, it never ceases to amaze me how frequently I'll see somebody not criticizing, but trash talking, talking serious shit. Mm -hmm. And then you go and look at their profile, and you're like, oh, you're a freelancer. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> what, what are you actually thinking? Just, these people read yeah. this, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah, I saw one, uh, one publisher... Uh, and I think a querying agent making a or literary agent mentioning it's like by the way when you submit stuff to us we actually do look at your social media yeah. and why after you've had this like 20 post diatribe about how we suck why would I want to hire you right right um, but it's that whole if you're really interested in a particular game line and you want to write for it definitely reading the submission guidelines and being familiar with the content uh, and what's already coming out will really mm -hmm. help. Because um, I see a lot of times where people are like, oh, I have this really cool idea for for X line. How about this? It's like, well, that's cool. But have you considered that we have this book, this mm -hmm. book, and this book that already covers those things? It's like, oh, for the next one. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please listen to All me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, it's that or overselling yourself it's just like well here's the stuff I've done you know uh, if you're interested or not and if, if someone's not interested in what you have to sell it's like well let's go work on stuff for a little bit and come back yeah. but it definitely don't attack people because they don't like your stuff yeah and that's 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 the really the the hard part as a um as a creator is especially for role-playing games it's like once it leaves your hands and gets published and it's in the hands of the fans it's it's theirs now Mm -hmm. uh, whatever your intent was, it's no longer yours. It's whatever the players decide to use at the table. It's like, well, and I'll, then from there, it's like, if people are upset with their experience, then it's like, well, I'm really sorry that that's, you know, my intent, this was my intent for this. This is why I wrote it this way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, by, it's like, raw, by raw, this is what, yeah, I really hate that too. It's like. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's the the key difference between writing for example a short story or a script or something mm -hmm. and writing a game you have to you have to give it up in either case but mm -hmm. in a game you're very actively saying here play like like and they're going to you know they, yeah. they, everyone's got somebody in their gaming party who is going to find a way to wreck that shit and oh yeah you can't take in that most... personally <laughs> oh yeah it's just um cuz like Every game, every universe or whatever, you really love the lore, but me might not like the mechanics. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So if I want to take the mechanics from this game that I do like and put it in with the setting stuff, cool. But I'm not going to go and write the hit up 
tag all the writers on Facebook or on Twitter and say, hey, this you're, you're writing shit. This is so much better. And it's just like, no, 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 don't do that. Definitely, definitely don't do that. <laughs> Honestly, like... I, I, I think with a lot of uh, I'm really super into indie horror right now, like these mm-hmm. these it's I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and and I find that even if I read an indie horror book that I hate, that I was just like this, unless it unless it offends me or I find it to be I keep that to myself, you know, like I because I, because I, we don't need because just because it I didn't care for it doesn't mean other people won't enjoy it. And I don't it's not such a secure little in uh, you know world that that can't fuck things up for somebody mm-hmm. uh so yeah just i'm not saying that we should always be nothing but love boxing everybody in, mm-hmm. in terms of that stuff but you know it's it, it, there's room for just keeping your mouth shut every now and then <laughs> yeah yeah and like i will like i i admit when i go to pick up a new book I'll go and I'll look at what the reviews are. I'll go to the one star reviews and see what people's problem was was the yep. the book. Yep. Like um and some it's like okay, why do people hate this book? And I know a lot some indie authors, uh especially like the ones that do the splatter the splatterpunk genre or the gore, the really gory the, the ones that are ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um they'll post those one star they'll wear those one star reviews with pride. It's like disgusting most vile thing or um that'll go on their media kit <laughs> oh yeah it's just yeah. like all these people absolutely hated this because they thought it was the most disgusting ever mission accomplished mm-hmm. I, this made me uncomfortable and it's like cool with a horror book or anything that's like touching on those sorts of issues it should make you uncomfortable mm-hmm. uh, that's but with like role-playing stuff like it's stuff that you're picking up to to interact with it in a way and recognizing that, Hey, there's all this stuff. That's why I really appreciate like all the safety tools and stuff. Absolutely. With role-playing games. Now that, that wasn't like a thing earlier on. Cause I, I like when I started playing years ago, I don't remember being given it out. <laughs> if it was an uncomfortable scene, it was like, you just played through it and then you felt really shitty. And then it's just yep. like, I'm never playing with this person again. Yep. Yeah, because it, when it comes down to it, you can experience all kinds of emotions in a role playing game, uh, but it's still a game. That's the important thing. And that doesn't mean that we can't touch on some heavy stuff, but you got to make sure everyone's along for that ride. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't think that I don't think that's too much to ask. I, I, I but but I'm a, a bleeding heart softy. Um, are there any resources uh uh, you know, obviously, you talk there. There's no master's degree in in tabletop role playing game design, for example. But are there any resources that you'd recommend for anybody who might be interested in in uh, learning a little more about the craft, so to speak? Well, there's submission guidelines, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, like, I think with community content, especially when they offer you like the layouts and stuff. It gives you an idea of how things, or style guides and stuff, it gives you an idea of how things are broken out and tiered, especially like in PDFs. So, because you can set up those sorts of outlines and things in Word mm-hmm. too. And uh, I know for my, um, my own script writing for comics and stuff, I started using the different size headers to break it up for different pages, chapters, panels to make it easier to navigate when I'm working on a project. Um, there are so many creative writing classes um, now, especially online. I know that uh, some more uh, prolific uh, TTRPG writers have offered uh, writing workshops. It's like, this is how you do it um, from from nothing. Um, I found that using think, like uh, online visualization tools like uh, Kumu or Muru is really, uh, really helpful because it's like, just getting the ideas down and like laying it out in a graph makes it helpful for pacing and stuff like that too. And um, like, like for visual puzzles, it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that go into what you're trying to do, but I think starting with a system that you're familiar with Mm -hmm. and because you already have that framework of your rule set already, because if you're trying to start, a game from nothing that's a little bit harder because now you have to figure out 
um, if your math, your dice math will work. And there's so many iterations that you can do with uh, with simulations and stuff like that. But if you're not including other people in playtesting it, you never know. And I think asking people to uh, to look at your stuff, read it, and then try to play it because some people are very either really increase incredibly positive or they're very negative. Like uh, trying to introduce a multi die system to a bunch of people that are used to playing D and D or D ten system is just like absolutely not. If there's <laughs> if you, like a it's like I have to roll more than one die. In all these occasions, no, absolutely not. Or like uh, exalted players, like no, don't take my dice away from me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or it's just um, it's just that sort of thing. It's like who are you pl- who are you making a game for? Are you making it for you to play with your friends, or are you trying to make it for a wider audience? And then figuring that out because then you're dealing with the OSR things or mm-hmm. work or whatever. There's just it's just having an outline and going with it. Uh, I think doing any sort of community-based thing where you're trying to get everyone's input to build a cohesive world or cooperatives thing is really cool. But if you don't have an outline for what they have to include or a standard for how to write it, it things get really disjointed and really muddled. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it is hurting cats to get people to update their Great. It's like we're all creatives. Everyone has a has their own life, so getting everyone on the same schedule is also really hard. That is, yeah, that's, that's... time management is definitely a great thing, and I w- I don't, I wish I was better at it. But honestly, honestly, that would be the class for a lot of people to take: take a time management class, take a project management class, uh, like get that all lined up and shiny, and and then we'll then we'll talk about your, I don't know, your orcs, whatever. Uh... <laughs> Okay, uh, well, that brings us to the end. Is there uh, anything coming out, anything you've got that you want to plug shamelessly and, and, and oh, endlessly? Man. So Out the Gates is the is the one that's coming up on Kickstarter. Uh, yes. Definitely check out um, at the At the Gates uh, Ashcan edition. It mm-hmm. is It gives you a complete scenario. It gives you pre-generated characters. So if you want to do a high fantasy adventure game, inspired by Japanese role-playing games, definitely check it out. It's our newest uh, StoryPath Ultra game. Uh, of course, World Below is crowdfunded. Uh, we have a jumpstart coming out for that. And uh, stay tuned for Scion Mythic Shards, uh, crowdfunding sometime in the near future. Um, and then we'll we'll see what craziness. And of course, uh, T- Titans Rising crowdfunded too, so check that out if you haven't done it already. Um, if you want to read books that are out right now, uh, they came from Classified. They came from the Cy- Cyclops' Cave, uh, Rat in a Burning Cage, and At the Gates. They're all out. <laughs> it's all there, people. It's so easy. Get out there, play those games, damn it. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for joining me on uh, Meet Your Maker. I, 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 especially with the, the, the time difference, it means a lot to me for you to be here. So thank you. Thank um, you. Is there any place in particular people can find you or they should find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Kim Godwin 18. Uh, you can find me on my website, uh, Kimberly Godwin.com or uh, studio H and H.com. Terrific. And my name is Phil Keeling. You can find me at uh, every Wednesday on uh, the pixel lit podcast. We are the greatest podcast that talks about video game novelizations because we are the only podcast that talks about video <laughs> game novelizations. Be there. Uh, thank you so much, Kim. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye.